Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We welcome you to this um, edition of Crossroads Assembly of God, Three Way Tennessee. We're just excited to be able to share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He loves you. Yes, he, he does. died for you and ask you to come and to be with him in heaven. I'm telling you, that's a that's quite a message that we can be born again and that we can have an eternal life with God. So today we're going to begin by a, a call to worship from Psalm, uh, I think it's Psalm 25. I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced, but disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me into your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me. For you, Lord, are good. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows a proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep his covenant and obey his demands. For the honor of your name, O Lord, forgive my many sins. Who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path they should choose. They will live in prosperity, and their children will inherit the land. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. He teaches his covenant. My eyes are always on the Lord. For he rescues me from the traps of my enemies. Turn to me and have mercy, for I am alone and in deep distress. My problems go from bad to worse. Oh, save me from them all. Feel my pain and see my troubles. Forgive all my sins. See how many enemies I have and how vicious they hate me. Protect me. Rescue my life from them. Do not let me be disgraced, for in you I take refuge. May integrity and honesty protect me. For I put my hope in you, O oh God, ransom Israel from all its trouble. Amen. Mm -hmm. There is a call to um, repentance and to faith yeah. in God. Even in the most difficult times of our lives, we can come to him and he will um, protect us yes. and restore us and bless us. We're going to worship the Lord with, a, a again, kind of a call and a prayer. As it says, open up the heavens. We waited for this day. We gathered in your name, calling out to you. You're glowing like a fire. Awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise Your presence in this place Your glory on our face We're looking to the sky Descending like a cloud You're standing with us now Flowing from your heart, filling every part. 
I just want to encourage you um, during this time. I that song just led led into it, just to open up our hearts and um, you know just letting the spirit of God touch mm-hmm. us. I know a lot of us are homebound. We've been um, you know social distancing, and the world is a different place. And I think God has given us an, a, a rare opportunity. And the opportunity is to just to take those times and extra times that we're not running here and there to sit at in his presence. It's an opportunity to just spend some really quality time with him and linger. And I wanted to open up with um, Proverbs because I think that's what the, the spirit of the Lord is longing for from his church. And this is Proverbs chapter 2. It's uh, King Lemur that his mother gave him these um, words and advice. And the whole book of Proverbs is that. But um, here she says, My son, if you will receive my words and lay up my commandments with yourself and incline your ear unto wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry after discernment and lift up your voice, for understanding, if you seek her, speaking of wisdom, if you speak wisdom as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you shall understand the fear of God and find the knowledge of the Lord. And I just thought just a lot of things packed in those five scriptures, but what a exhortation to us as believers I don't think we have a clue as to how much the Lord longs to speak to us, to yield his spirit to us, to um, give us all things that we need. He longs us to come to him and to cry out to him and to seek his face. We just don't have an idea of the heart of God for his church, but he longs, he longs for us. And he desires and his heart is longing after us. And I think the the instructions are this in verse one. It tells us to receive and treasure, receive his words and treasure them. This is something that I think is huge for the church to receive in your. I'm not talking about just church. It's a part of that, but really more so, it's you coming to the Lord yourself with the word in front of you and spending time with Jesus to receive his words as you read his word and treasure it, 
treasure it, place high value, esteem it highly as so important to your spiritual life. So receive and treasure. In verse 2, it tells us to listen or incline your ear. That means listen and apply. The Lord has something to say to us. And we have slowed down and the Lord has made us come to a screeching halt so that we can listen. And once we listen and we hear those words, we need to apply them to our own life. And some people never self self-evaluate. But we need to apply them to our own life. And then in verse 3, it tells us to cry up, cry out, and lift up our voice. We need to cry out to the Lord for discernment. We need to cry out to the Lord for understanding and wisdom. He has given it to us. He says, you know, just seek it and you will find it. And the, th the problem with us as the church is that we're not seeking it. And we're not treasuring it and we're not valuing it we want it to we just want to sit and let somebody else feed it to us like baby birds and with no effort and the lord is saying i want you personally to come unto me and cry out and lift up your voice to me the bible says he that comes to god must first believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him the lord is going to reward you with understanding and enlightenment and discernment and in verse 4, it just tells us to seek Jesus and to search the scriptures. We need to seek the face of Jesus in the word because we know him by the word. This is his voice to us when it's quickened by the Holy Spirit. That word is quickened to our spirit. And he speak to us, speaks to us. There's nothing more powerful than that. And the Bible promises us a blessing if we do those things in verse 5. He says, what is the blessing of the hunt, this treasure hunt that we go on so that we can enrich ourselves, enrich our own spirit to be more like him? And it says, you will understand the fear of God. You will have a great respect and an understanding. And it says, you will find the knowledge of the Lord. In other words, you are going to know your God. You're going to know him in a personal way, not a bunch of little scriptures that you have tied up here in your head. Not a little facts and figures about the Bible, but that you know the heart of God. That's something completely different. This is where the Pharisees messed up. We need to know the heart of God. And that's, that's just the word of exhortation, but I believe that's the crying and the wooing of the Holy Spirit to his church at this time, is come unto me. Please come. Search and seek, and I will bless you and reward you. Amen. 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 Well, it goes along with the message today in, in one sense. You'll, you'll get there. I, I do want you to take notice. We uh, The backdrop today is, again, the garden tomb. I'll eventually get to that place where we speak of the resurrection and its meaning and uh, one meaning in our lives. Uh, but God bless you uh, yes. today. Uh, we're going to speak to you that uh, God is not mocked. The scripture for today is found in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. The New Living Translation says, Do, Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. I have a little issue with the translation this morning because it literally, uh, the, the Greek literally says God is not mocked. And it's a very personal thing. The word mocked just means the turning up of the nose, the sneering uh, face, that uh, which is a very personal uh, rejection of God, a ridicule of God. And Paul makes it very clear that um, you God is not mocked. Okay? Man is not going to uh, look in the face of God and turn up his nose and say, I don't care. And uh, the proof that Paul gives to us is um, that God is not mocked is, is that every man will reap what he sows. This is just a very um, easy to understand concept because we can go to the garden and we can plant a seed and we know that whatever we plant is going to come up. 
we're never surprised by what comes up. It is a, uh, a very simple image that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is not going to be mocked. He says, if you, uh, Paul applies it this way, as he says, if you sow to the sinful nature or to your flesh, or if you sow to pleasure, if you sow whatever you sow, whatever field you sow in, those things are going to reap destruction. But if you sow to the Spirit, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit, if you sow to the Holy Spirit, then you will, you will reap uh, a spiritual harvest, and in this case, he says it's eternal life, okay? You'll reap eternal life. Now, Paul's giving us the long view on life. He says, you may not see it now. You may just only see the sowing. You may see a few shoots come out of the ground, but as long as you continue to sow to the Spirit, in the end, you will reap eternal life. That's the ultimate harvest. Okay. Along the way, we may see his grace, his blessing, his gifts, his fruit, his good works. All of these may be part of our present day harvest. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I know what I just said to you, but I, I, I know also that that is a, a very Americanized uh, version of that verse. I don't think, I, maybe I shouldn't tell you, but the truth is, is that Paul, in referring to eternal life, um, he's doing so because I believe he wants to keep himself from promising modern day prosperity or success or happiness. And these are the typical things we think of when we say, oh, I want to sow into the kingdom of God. I, <clears throat> I want to reap a harvest in this life. The reality of Paul's world was is that not everyone was experiencing the good life, the good life. Life may be tough for us. If sickness may come, weakness may come. We, we may struggle in many, many different ways. Paul makes this statement in Romans 8. He says, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm we are God's children. And since we are his children, then we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are the heirs of God's glory. And there's that eternal life coming for us. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Now, that's not an American gospel. Um, that is a gospel that I have seen firsthand in foreign countries. I've seen the persecution of the church literally seen it. I've seen men arrested. Uh, I, I've talked to them. I've seen the, the bruises upon their bodies. I've listened to time and time again to their testimonies of what they have suffered for Christ. Just because they're Christians, just because they believed in God, just because they wanted to serve God. It's not an American experience. We, we have a, a gospel that says if we sow to God, then we'll reap of the blessings of God. It will be a good thing, and all our lives will turn into a rose garden, and everything will be perfect. And that's not the story of the Bible, and that's not the story of the, especially of the New Testament. Life can be tough, and we're facing some tough times now, and, and we perhaps are having a hard time understanding why we're going through such a difficult time. Paul makes it real for us in verse 18. He says, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. And I'm not sure that's not in us. There will be in the future, if we suffer with him, if we endure with him, there's going to be a, a greater glory uh, revealed to us and in us, this eternal life, this eternal city, this a new heaven, a new earth, a new, a new, uh, a, a, a great victory over sin and death and even the devil. Okay. Later on in chapter eight, he 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 said these words: "Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity?" 
or are persecuted, or are hungry, or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death. Does it mean that God doesn't love you if these things happen? Now, Paul's answer is absolutely not. God still loves you even if you're going through a trial, even if you're going through the most difficult time of your life. It doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. He goes on to say in verse 36, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. He's quoting there from Isaiah, I think. Um, but he gives that last charge in verse 37. No, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Therefore, suffering and hardship and difficulty may be a part of our lives. And yet, I have a promise, and we have a promise, that God is not mocked. Now, there's a negative sense in which you're not able to fool God, okay? You may be able to fool your own mother or your pastor, but you're not going to be able to fool God, okay? What you sow is going to reap. It's going to come out. But there's also a positive side, I believe a very positive side, that God will not be mocked by the unbeliever either. God will guard his reputation and the honor of his name. In the Old Testament prophecy of Joel, the people of God are suffering. There's, there's um, if you will, they've sown to their sinful nature. And they're reaping a disaster. And in this case, it's a locust plague and everything associated with it as they lose their crop. They lose the ability to plant next year's um, crop because they have no seed in which to to uh, to save to put in the ground for the next year. Their lives are in jeopardy, and the prophet says and stands up and says this in chapter two and verse fifteen. He says, "Blow the the ram's horn in Jerusalem, announce a time of fasting, call the people together for a solemn assembly, gather all the people, the elders." Even the baby, the children and the babies call the bridegroom from his chamber and the bride from her private room. Well, this is uh, the response, uh, a call to prayer, a call to repentance that, that the prophet is making upon the people. And it's an urgent call. It's urgent for two reasons. Number one, there's an urgency in the land that the land is desolate and the people are suffering and they're going through a tremendous trial. And so there's an urgency on their part, but there's also an urgency with God because God's calling them to repentance. As he calls each one of us in times of trouble and disaster, he's calling us to repentance. Amen. He's calling us to prayer. Draw close to me, he says. Verse 17, he speaks to the priest who should know the, the presence of God and, and, the, and the word of God. But he says, let the priests who minister in the Lord's presence stand and weep between the entry room to the temple and the altar. Let them pray. Here's their prayer. Spare your people, Lord. Now, he's called the people to repentance, and this is important. They call the people to repentance. You can't any longer live in your sin. You can't live in rebellion. You can't continue to sow to the flesh. You can't continue to sow to the sinful nature. But once they are come to this solemn assembly, then the the, the, the leadership of that church or of that uh, of that uh, of the nation, the spiritual leadership of the nation, they are calling for mercy from God. Spare your people, Lord. Don't let your special possession become the object of mockery. Don't let them become a joke for unbelieving foreigners who say, has the God of Israel left them? Can you hear that? The neighboring nations looking to Israel and seeing the, the locust plague and saying, oh, wow, where's the God of Israel? Well, that may be their first response and and in an action of concern, but it turns into the to the, to a accusation. We oh we have sacrificed to Baal. We have sacrificed to Dagon. Look at us. We're fine. Where's the God of Israel? Ha ha ha! 
Look at us. Everything's good for us. But, oh, man, they're suffering through the worst locust plague of a generation. Where is their God? Well, it turns into mockery. Again, I want you to note, and it's very important, third time I've said it, there has to be a time of repentance. The cry of mercy is significant. The cry of uh, for mercy is significant. We cry out to God in repentance and then a cry for mercy. They understood that God is mocked when the surrounding nations begin to ask that question, where is your God? It's not the only the mockery of Israel, but it was also the mockery of God himself. Now, this <clears throat> concept or this understanding is consistent throughout the Old Testament. Psalm 79, verses 9 through 11 says, Help us, O God of our salvation. Help us for the glory of your name. Save us and forgive our sins for the honor of your name. Why should pagan nations be allowed to scoff, asking, Where is their God? Show us your vengeance against the nations, for they have spilled the blood of your servants. Listen to the moaning of the prisoners and demonstrate your great power by saving those who are condemned to die. Here's the cry. God, protect the honor of your name. God, don't let the enemy scoff at us. Where is your God? Psalm 115 says a similar thing. As he says, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name goes all the glory for your unfailing love and faithfulness. Why let the nation say, where is their God? Why do that? Our God is in the heavens. <laughs> I love that answer. Amen. I love that answer. Where is your God? Our God is in the heavens, and he does whatever he wishes. Amen. They, they had a God. He's in the temple down there. He's made of stone or wood or covered in gold, whatever it is. But our God is is in heaven. Their idols were merely things of silver and gold and shaped by human hands. This is, I'm reading scripture here. Verse 5 says, they have mouths that cannot speak and eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear and mouths that cannot breathe. They have hands but cannot feel and feet that cannot walk and throats that cannot make a sound. And those who make idols are just like them, as are all who trust in them. Where is your God, Israel? He's in heaven. And he does whatever he pleases. The most famous uh, where is your God question comes, I believe, from, from Psalm 42. As David writes, as the deer longs for the streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. Where can I go and stand before him? Day and night I only have tears for food, while my enemies continually taunt me, saying, Where is this God of yours? There's some disaster that's come to the life of the psalmist. And all around him, people are asking that question, Where is this God of yours? You say you trust in him. You say you serve him. But where is he in your time of need, in your time of struggle? Verses 9 and 10 say, Oh God, my rock, I cry. Why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? Their taunts break my bones. They scoff. Where is this God of yours? I was greatly moved by verse 10. For I don't think that I have fully understood or fully been broken in the presence of God. As people around us ask that question, where is the God of healing in this time? Where is the God that you serve during this time? Why is it that the church is not protected? Why is it that the Believer's life has, is left untouched. Many months ago, I ran across an article. I just saw the title. It's COVID-19 and the End of Faith Healing. It's actually written by a Nigerian um, journalist, uh, Leo Igwe. 
Um, he's talking about the many um, healers in his nation, and they have a, a perhaps a um, a more uh, open, more open. Um, uh, being able to be seen, okay. And there's the Christian church that practices faith healing. There's a there, yeah, the Muslim, the Islamic faith healers. There's shamans or witch doctors who do do the same. And he's going to attack all three. The church is not just one part of it. But he ends his uh, he ends this article uh, that that says that no one has been able to pray for someone to be healed. And he ends it with this paragraph. So where are the faith healers of the various religious traditions as the world is trying to find a remedy for COVID-19? Why can't they command as they do during their faith healing sessions that the coronavirus be dead and never affect anyone in Jesus or Allah's name? Or have they stopped working and performing miracles? Have they ceased dispensing divinely orchestrated healings? Are faith healers, like scientists, also in their labs trying to uh, ascertain a cure from the gods? Or better, are we seeing, seeing an end to the faith healing enterprise? You know, this is something that breaks my heart. I was at a convention this week in Arkansas. We had people from all, not necessarily all over the country, but all over the region. Uh, Louisiana, Texas, Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee. But I had to tell the convention, um, this, I told the convention this reality, that if we meet together and uh, we become a COVID-19 hotspot, in the world and the media and perhaps health officials and the government may point uh, a finger in our faces and say to us, where is your God? Think about that for a moment. If your God exists, why doesn't he protect you? If he exists, then why did he not heal you? If he exists, then why did not he at least reveal that person who had COVID-19 as they walked into the building so that you could tell them, no, you cannot enter. We've discerned that you have the virus. You see, their taunts really break my bones. Because our society is asking, where is this God of yours? Where is this God of yours? Where is your God? That's an important question for us in this time. Where is your God? As I read these scriptures and I read the Old Testament especially, I see that God does protect the honor of his name. In the story of of uh, Genesis 18, God goes to Abraham and says, I'm not going to withhold this from you. I'm about to go down and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Its sins have come up to me, and I, I'm going to judge those cities. And Abraham, concerned that there might be a righteous man there and that God is going to kill the, the unrighteous and the righteous at the same time. And, and so he says to God, will not the judge of all the earth do what is right. It was Abraham's way of saying, uh, God, you don't want your name to be spoken ill of. You don't want to be perceived as, as an unjust judge. You need to protect the honor of your name. And so Abraham bargains its way down to if he could find 10 people in the city that was righteous, that the cities could be spared. He couldn't. They would be destroyed. When Moses later uh, is, is interceding for Israel, they have, as Abraham says, cast their jewelry into a fire and out came a golden calf. 
And so they held a festival and all kinds of sin uh, were part of that festival. And they worshiped that golden calf. And God says to Moses, Moses, I'm just going to destroy all of them. I'm just going to kill them all. I'll start over with you, you and your family. You'll be the new chosen family. And Abraham says, or Moses says, listen, God, no, 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 you can't. Because if Egypt hears about this, they'll say of you that you had evil intention when you brought them out of Egypt. You've got to protect the honor of your name. You protect the honor of your name. In other words, Israel, Egypt will think you wanted to destroy Israel instead of wanting to fulfill the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. God is going to protect the honor of his name. Throughout, there's many victories that are won, only simply for the glory of God. In Judges 7, Gideon is going to fight against the Midianites. There's maybe 100,000 of the enemy army, and 32,000 men of Israel are mustered together under Gideon, and God says, you know, there's just too many here. If uh, if we fight today and you win the battle, you'll, you'll say, ah, well, this is, we did it in our own strength. So God said to, to Gideon, send some home. If they're afraid or got something better to do, just send them home. And so there's 10,000 people left, 10,000 men left. And God said to them, well, you know, if I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast that they saved themselves by their own strength. And so he took them to a, uh, a brook and had them drink. And, and uh, those that uh, lapped like a dog, they were sent home and those who pulled that water up to their mouth, they were, they were left. 300 men. And God won the victory. But it was for his glory and for his honor. There was a time in 1 Samuel 4 that uh, the ark was lost in battle to the Philistines. Israel had brought the ark in as a, uh, in order that God would fight for them. And uh, they lost the battle. The Philistines took the ark and they said, oh, well, we'll just add this to our our temple and all the different gods that are there. And on the first night, Dagon, their, their idol, which must have been a pretty good sized statue, fell face down in front of the ark. They put it back up and the next day it was uh, again found on the ground. This time its arms and its legs were broken off. God was going to defend the honor of his name. They said, we can't keep this ark. Let's send it back home. They were uh, sickness had come into the city, and they said, we're going to send it home. God defended the honor of his name. David understood this as he fought the giant, as uh, the giant uh, came out and said, oh, just uh, uh, send someone out to fight me. If if I win, if you win, you will be your servants. If, if, um, if. I win, you'll be our servants. Great fear in all of Israel. And David running towards that giant says, You have come against me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the Lord of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. You've mocked him, Goliath. You've mocked him. And I'm come to defend the honor of his name. There's one other story in the Old Testament that I would bring to you and just remind you of. And that's the story of Hezekiah. In uh, Isaiah chapter 36 and 37, there's a story of, of how Sennacherib came and surrounded the city of Jerusalem. He had done that to many cities in, in Israel and Samaria and uh, He's going to uh, take captive all the people of Jerusalem. He makes a deal for them. If you open the doors now, I, I'll let you live here for a while. But uh, eventually, I'll take you. I'll take some of you to a place just as nice as this, and you'll be able to live out your lives there. Of course, this is unacceptable to the people of Israel. They're not going to surrender, and and so the enemy comes to them. The enemy comes and talks to them. He talks to the, to the people on the wall, listening. And it's, they say, don't let Hezekiah mislead you by saying the Lord will rescue you. 
have the, have the gods of any other nations ever saved their people from the king of Assyria? What happened to the gods of Hamath or Arpad? And what happened to the gods of Shepharim? And did any god rescue Samaria from my power? What god of any nation has ever been able to save its people from my power? So what makes you think the Lord can re rescue Jerusalem from us? What a compelling question. What makes you think that the Lord can, that he is able, oh wow, to rescue Jerusalem from me? Well, it's amazing. It's amazing because we see in this story what is necessary. Just as in the story of Joel chapter 2, there must be someone who defends the honor of God. In this case, it's not in action or in deed, but in sackcloth and ashes, in prayer and in fasting, in repentance and in tears. When Hezekiah hears the report from his leadership, he tears his clothes. This is a, an action of mourning. He takes off his royal robes and he puts on what we know today as burlap, something that is uncomfortable and something that is not beautiful, that is, it is, uh, it is unkind to the skin and, and unpleasant to look at. It is a reflection of his heart that is broken, his, his unwillingness to enjoy the pleasures of this life, but to repent in sackcloth and ashes. And he sends his, his top leadership, his administrators, to Isaiah to say, and he said this to Isaiah, Today is a day of trouble, insults, and disgrace. It is like when a child is ready to be born, but the mother has no strength to deliver the baby. But perhaps the Lord, your God, has heard the Assyrian chief of staff sent by the king to defy the living God. And we'll punish him for his words. Oh, pray for, uh, for those of us who are left. Isaiah doesn't take long because even the king's men and all the priests that came with the king's leadership had come to them in a, in a burlap um, robe. They were all in mourning, in repentance, seeking for God's answer. This is what Isaiah says. This is what the Lord says. Do not be disturbed by this blasphemous speech against me from the Assyrian king's messenger. Listen, I will move, I myself will move against him. He promises that the king will withdraw and that the king will eventually be killed in his own land. God answered their prayers. I ask you a question today. Where are the Hezekiahs of today? Where are the Eliakims of today? The Shibnas of the day? Where are these priests of today? Where are the people that are willing to put on sackcloth and ashes, who are willing to pray, to fast, to mourn, to, to have their, their bones be, be, be in pain because the people of this world are saying, where is your God? Because the people of this world says God is of no value. There is no, there is no uh, answer that will come from God. I tell you today that we are the Hezekiahs of this time. We are those priests of Joel chapter 2 and verse 17. We must be concerned with the honor of the name of God. He will not be mocked, my friends. He will not be mocked. Let me say that again and again. He will not be mocked. We must defend him. And we're not being called to defend him in, in protest or in signs upon our upon our bodies or upon our upon our streets. Uh, we, we are not to call to write an article or even to preach this sermon. I, I, I am calling you not to, not to protest, but to repentance and to tears, to fasting and to prayer. I believe that this is the way in which we, in, in, 
in which we acknowledge God, the, the way in which you and I um, call for God to defend the honor of his name. It's not yet announced, but I've heard that it's coming, that the, uh, the Assemblies of God and many of the other denominations of, of the nation are going to join together for prayer and fasting in August uh, for 40 days, a cry for national repentance and a cry for God to intervene in our situation. And I say to you, it's high time that this happened. I've said this before, as we started this uh, uh, FaceTime, uh, Face, Facebook Live uh, broadcast in, in the end of March and April, I, I thought it would only be a few weeks. I thought, well, we'll get through April. And, or I wanted to come back in, in, in by Easter, I, you know, just spend a few weeks away. But, but, we, but it, is, it has changed. And there is this question that comes up. Why aren't we praying for healing? Why aren't we praying for protection? Why aren't we? Are we simply afraid? Are we simply afraid that God will not answer? Are we simply afraid that God has no power over this virus, over our situation? When we come together in prayer and fasting, we are acknowledging that God is worthy of our sacrifice. He's worthy of our time. He's worthy of our devotion. We are saying that his concern is our greatest concern. And let me tell you, let me tell you something. I, I say this as kindly as I can. He's not overly concerned about a virus. He's not overly concerned about the economic distress that we're in because what's more important to God is the condition of your heart. The condition of your heart, are you truly living for God? Is your heart truly devoted unto him? He's concerned with your spiritual health more than he is your physical health. I know he cares about your condition. I, I know if you're sick today that God cares about what's going on in your body and what's going on in your life. But I say to you that his first concern, his first concern is the condition of your heart because absolutely God cares more about where you spend eternity than he does how you spend these few short years upon this earth. He's more concerned about you spending eternity with him than he is any other question that, that you may have for him today. He wants you to spend eternity with himself in heaven. And the question is, is will you make that choice or will you choose a destiny in hell, separated from God and from his family? The hope of Joel chapter 2 and verse 17 is, is that the people will respond to a time of fasting and prayer. They'll come in repentance. They'll call that solemn assembly, and they'll actually spend time with God seeking his face. And that the priesthood, those spiritual leaders of that day, will rise and pray, God, spare your people. We need to see that that is what God is calling the spiritual leadership of our nation to do. Uh, God sees their repentance in Joel 2. And he then promises to restore what the locusts have eaten. He promised to restore the years that has been taken from them. Oh, my friends, if we could see as well that God doesn't stop with the restoration, but the promise of Joel 2, 28 and 29 is that I, I will pour out my spirit upon all people of the earth. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even upon your servants, men and women servants, I will pour out my Holy Spirit. And this is a promise that goes beyond anything that they were asking for. They were asking for food. Oh, God, provide for us. Oh, God, make a way for us to survive. And God says, I'll do more than that. I'll restore. I'll give to you what you need on the physical level, but I'm also going to use you spiritually to spread my glory over all the earth. You're going to be my instruments uh, in which I can use uh, to spread this gospel, the good news about who I am and what I'm able to do by what you've experienced by the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. God is not mocked. He will defend the honor of his name. And in the process, he will restore our lives and call us to new spiritual heights. He does this so that we might be useful in his hands. Let me close um, by going to the most important place that I see this theme in Scripture, and that is in the story of Jesus' trial and his crucifixion. 
You see, the mockery of Jesus begins in the Sanhedrin's courts. They continue into, into Pilate's palace, uh, Herod's palace, and continue in Pilate's judgment hall. They mock the Son of Man. They mock the Word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. They mock this one that we call Jesus. In Luke chapter 22, the Bible says this, the guards in charge of Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and said, prophesy to us, who hit you this time? They hurled all sorts of terrible insults at him. He was sent to Herod, so Luke says, the Bible says in Luke 23, 11, then Herod and his soldiers began mocking and ridiculing Jesus. And finally, they put a royal robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. Mockery. Ridicule. This is the Jewish king, they said. In Pilate's hall, the soldiers leading that beating that was commanded by Pilate it was done in the audience of an entire regiment. Perhaps as many as a thousand men came out to see the king of the Jews stripped and whipped with lashes 40 times. The Bible says they stripped him and they put a royal robe on him, scarlet robe. They, robe, they wove branches of thorns and placed it upon his head and they placed a reed stick in his hand as a scepter. And they knelt before him in mockery and taunted him. Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him. And they grabbed his stick and they struck him in the head with it. And when they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put on his own clothes and led him away to be crucified. While being crucified, people would walk by and mock him. They would uh, say, well, he trusted in God, let God say him. They looked at him and they said, you who said you would destroy the temple and three, destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well, if you are the son of God, then save yourself and come down from that cross. Again, some of the leading priests and the teachers of the law and the elders said he saved others, but he himself, he cannot save. So he's the king of, of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross now and we'll believe him. He trusted God. So let God rescue you now, him now, if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the revolutionaries who were crucified with him ridiculed him in the same way. Mockery is found everywhere in the story of the crucifixion, the trial and the crucifixion. And I know, listen, there are many reasons for the resurrection and for me to focus upon only this one thing. The mockery that he received is perhaps not the best interpretation of these passages. But I find these words compelling today. God, he is not mocked. They mocked his son, and in doing so, they mocked him. And God is not going to allow his son to be mocked without consequence. The resurrection is a judgment. It says to those first century Jews, you are wrong to sentence him to death. It says to Herod, you are wrong to ignore his innocence. It says to Pilate, you are wrong to carry out that sentence of death. It says to the crowds that yelled, crucify him, crucify him. You are wrong to choose Jesus, to command or to demand that Jesus be crucified. To the crowds it's at the cross, it says to you, to, that he is my son. He is my son, and I will receive him, and I do want him, and I will save him. Just you wait. To the soldiers who mocked him by putting a sign upon that cross, this is the king of the Jews. God was saying, this is my son who is the 
king of the Jews, and I will defend him. Hear me today. God is not mocked. I, I call you today. Stop playing games with God. We're living in a time of great distress, and by our inaction, church, I'm talking to believers right now. I'm, I'm talking about you who are really spiritual. Stop playing games. Let's go to God in prayer and repentance and cry for the mercy of God. We're in great distress in this nation, and our inaction is saying that God cannot do anything about our situation. We seem to be afraid to pray. We're afraid of the answer. We're afraid of the shaking of the bony finger of Satan in our face that says, where is your God? Do you know him? Then pray and fast and seek him with all your hearts. I say to anyone who's playing games with God, stop ignoring the reality that he's the God of heaven, that he wants a relationship with you, that he holds uh, He holds your life in his hands. Uh, he's ready to meet every need in your life and, 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 and walk with you through the darkest valley that you face. But you got to stop playing games with him. you got to stop sowing to your flesh, to your sinful nature, because you are going to reap what you sow. The day is coming when the name of Jesus will be held in the highest honor. I promise you this reality, because this is scripture from beginning to end, that once Jesus endured the mockery of the cross, because of his obedience to the Father, he faced ridicule and rejection as no other man is faced. But after the cross, God highly exalted him and gave to him to uh, gave him a name that is above every name and though that name may be mocked now though that name may be ridiculed now may even though nations and people may say to us the church where is your god now there is coming a day in which that name will be revealed as the most exalted, highest name, most important name in all the universe. And every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth is going to bow. And every tongue in heaven and on earth and under the earth is going to declare that Jesus, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Because I say to you today, God will not be mocked. He will defend the honor of that name. He's coming soon. I believe and I call the church and I'm calling us to participate in whatever call of prayer and fasting that's coming. I believe that if not, we as a church are going to, to prepare that time in which we truly seek God. We need a turnaround in this nation, in our state, in our local city. I'm praying for that turnaround to come when God hears our prayers and brings honor to his name once again. Amen and amen. Well, praise God. I just want to pray with you for a moment that God would touch your life and be with you in this time. So, Father in heaven, I do pray for each one that has heard today the message. I'm praying, Lord, that in, you will come into their situation. Some are facing great disaster and great struggle. Some are just uh, alone and needing your companionship. But I pray, Lord, that you will come and bring forth your healing and your life. I also pray that they will hear and respond to the call to prayer, and that we will be a people that will honor your name, that we will be a people that acknowledge that you are our God. And may your name be honored in all the earth, O Lord. May your name be praised. And may no one ever have to ask us, where is our God? God bless you today. Praise the Lord for his goodness and his grace. Amen and amen.